Welcome back to another show. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, and I'm your host here on the show of Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. And we've got a very, very special show for you today. I'm welcoming back some very successful students of mine, Dan and Crystal Muhorter, and I'm excited to have them back on to today's show. They're going to be telling and sharing their story on what we call the private money deal with lots of lessons. But uh, before we get into that, let me go ahead and welcome Dan and Crystal. Welcome to the show. Hey, Jay. Thanks so much, Jay. It's great to be here with you. Absolutely. It's great to have you back. In fact, it's been a while since I had you on the show. You may not know this, but we recently celebrated uh, the one-year anniversary of the show, and we are fast tracking to 200,000 downloads and listens. So uh, we're having a good time. Awesome. So anyway, just to, for everyone to know, oh, by the way, folks, in case you can't make it to the end of the show, I want to let you know that if, in case you want to meet Dan and Crystal and myself, and after you hear their story, you're for sure going to want to meet them. We've got an upcoming live event not too far away. And if you want to check out at what happens at our live events, you can go to jayconner.com, www.jayconner.com forward slash live event. That's L-I-V-E, E-V-E-N-T, all one word. And you can see what we do at the live events and how we share with each other on how to make a lot of money in real estate investing. So for those of you that are just listening and not watching the video, that URL one more time is www.jayconner.com forward slash live event. Well, Dan and Crystal, you all have been real estate investing for how long? You started back when? 1996. 1996. So as I recall, Crystal, you were like, you would live in the home, you would invest in the home, you'd fix it up, and then you'd sell it, then you'd go buy another one, and then you'd live in it while you were fixing it up. Was that right? That's correct. Perfect. Yeah, so it was something that I was doing on the side. I had a full-time career, so there this is something I did on the side at that time. Right, and your full-time career before going full-time real estate investing was what? I was an occupational therapist for 26 years. Yeah. And Dan, uh, what was your career before coming in full-time real estate investing? I did a little over 21 years in the military and the Navy, and then I did about 16 years as a government contractor for the Coast Guard. Right. And so as of today's show, you all have been full-time real estate investing for how long, approximately? A little over two years. A little over two years. And let's see here. Y'all came into my world, what, about... Three years ago or so? Just, a, yep. About nine months, I think, before um, before I stepped away from my career. Yep. There you go. There you go. So, okay. So after we started working together about nine months, that's when you went full-time and you were, you got, you released yourself from the, from the full-time day job, right? Yes. <laughs> awesome. And Dan, you came along full-time, uh, what, about a year and a half down the road? Just six months after her. There you go. There you go. So approximately how much profit have you made since we started working together in real estate? What are we looking at? Uh, 3.75 million in cash and equity. That's our, yeah, cash yeah. and equity. About 3.75 million in cash and equity, yeah. And you've uh, raised how much private money? We now have... Oh, and I should have figured this out before we got back together because we just got an additional three hundred and fifty thousand. So we are just over about one point five million. Nice, congratulations! Well, on today's show, we want to talk about one of your deals and dive in and talk about the lessons that you learned from it. So we're calling this the private money deal with a lot of lessons, right? <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> okay. Well, let's hear all about it. We want to know how you found the property, what the numbers look like, how you funded it, the profit, your exit strategy, and then we want to learn some lessons. 
Absolutely. We're all about sharing those lessons because not everybody should have to pay the amount that we did to get them. Um, so we identified this property as a bank owned property. So it came from our realtor. We had taken a look at the property several times and each time it was under contract and later the deal fell through. So we ultimately were able to put an offer in. Our offer was accepted at 67000 it was a five bedroom, two full bath, little over 3,500 square foot. And it was a, a much older home. So it was a brick back um, from the 1900s. The property previously had had some renos started. And unfortunately, they obviously weren't able to finish. And so we took it from there. The rehab was estimated at 32000 We started with a contractor that we had identified through some advertising. They'd reached out to us. We checked their references that they gave us, the references they gave us, and everything looked good. We started them working. Unfortunately, we found quite a ways in that all the investment we had provided into that property had not panned out. So they had a lot of things that they made look like they had been working on but weren't complete. So they had even put in faux piping, if you will, to make it look like they had done the plumbing. And they had someone that walked around and did a lot of painting. So we saw that gentleman busy at work the whole time. And so they had been paid a considerable amount. And then we had to hire an additional contractor. They walked off the job with our funds and the job was not complete. We ultimately completed the rehab after investing an additional 20000 and so our total investment at that time was 119000 Our exit strategy was that we ended up selling to a tenant buyer. So this was purchased with 100000 in private money. So 100000 and we had 67000 that went towards the purchase and then the additional towards the rehab. And then obviously we needed to put in a little bit of our own funds based on the fact of what happened with that contractor. We sold the house for $259,900. So our cash out was $140,900 on the back end. While we had the tenant buyer working through their process, we were paying a little over $800 a month for our payment. So $833 a month. We were leasing it out for $1,750 a month. And so we made just under $900 a month in profit on that. So it was certainly equitable in the long run and it all worked out. However, we learned a lot of lessons along the way. So I'm going to let Dan go ahead and start filling us in on some of those lessons unless you have some questions about the actual deal structure itself before we move on. No, you're good. Go ahead, Dan. What'd y'all learn from this? <laughs> well, first thing I learned is you've got to have a really good realtor to get these deals to begin with, and which we do. It was, it was great. This one here was a first time try on this realtor. He was kind of a one shot and disappeared on us afterwards, but it was a great profit or a great uh, project to get started on. One of the things I learned walking into it is that when you walk into a house and you're trying to walk through it with an open mind, I saw a sheet on the kitchen counter and in it, I saw a list of realtors showing the house. I saw where electricians were brought in and plumbers were brought in and suddenly a month later, another realtor was showing a house and then here was another electrician and another plumber and another inspector and just kept going. And I noticed they had apparently tried to sell this house 11 times already with wow. earnest money in place at $1,000 per earnest money. So one of the reasons why we offered much lower than what the bank was asking for was because they already received $11,000 in earnest money that these contractors and flippers couldn't follow through on. They set a very, very short time frame on being able to get that money. Within 24 hours, you had to have that money in place to that bank that was outside of the state, and nobody could do it but us. So we managed to get it there within 24 hours, and we locked it down. So that was one of the reasons why we were able to make such a low offer. on They wanted 97000 or 96000 or something like that. Well, by that time that we were offering on it, it was already down to seventy eight. Yeah. And then we made a sixty-seven just based on what we thought the numbers you sure. could make work. And they so, accepted it. So those were positive <laughs> things. And that was a great thing that now we get into the less than positive things. Never be in a hurry to get a contractor. Never, never rush through that. And while they may give you references, those references may be muddied by their friends. In other words, these numbers may be their friends that you're calling. And 
it's really difficult to, to identify that. If they give you projects, you need to do more than just call these numbers. You need to go a little, di- little bit deeper into that and try and identify them. If they have insurance that is within 90 days of expiration, contractor's insurance, make sure you do not get on board with this because there's a good chance that they're going to let that lapse while they're on the project. And it, it may be that way for a reason. In this case, this gentleman started talking about health issues and said he couldn't get insurance to renew. And so that was another problem. Pay more attention to the, the projects that are being done. Why are they painting right off the bat when it's a full rehab? Didn't make any sense. But he had this guy run around with a bucket and a brush and that's all he's doing. Like, I don't get what you're doing here. He was doing the floor, refinishing the floor before they finished doing the ceilings and things like that. It just the the scope of work didn't match what we were asking them to do. And so his comments were constantly, well, I know what I'm doing. You don't. So running the project, learning how to control your contractor, so to speak, and rein them in when they get off scope. That's important. Making sure the payouts are done correctly. That's and Crystal will talk more about that, but that's very, very important. Identifying whether, I mean, go turn the water on to make sure water isn't spraying everywhere. When he says, I finished the plumbing, I, pr- I probably should have done that. I didn't do it. But he, he literally created valves in the bathrooms to make it look, he had a cutout in each of the bathrooms, made it look like there was plumbing in place, all brand new, and it looked perfect. I went, great. But when I went to grab a hold of it, it came right out of the wall. It was completely fake. <laughs> like, like, oh hey, my God. Hey, look, hey, look, you two can't make this stuff up. You no. Know? <laughs> you can't. No. And then, you know, he asked for one last payment. This was before, obviously, we found all those issues. And I did the payout on it. And the holdback was so little at that time, it didn't matter anymore. And he said he needed it for a major purchase of, of product. And he gave me the list of product. And I said, okay, you know, go ahead. And he disappeared. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. there we go. So what, what would you have done differently back then if you had knew, known then what you know now? Well, if I had known then what I know now, first of all, rather than just calling people that he had provided his reference, we would find out, was he paying his vendors? Was he paying his subcontractors? What do all these relationships look like? Those are things that hadn't occurred to me. I had had enough experience and I hadn't learned things that, you know, told me to go ahead and do that. So hadn't even dawned on me, but that would have been obviously would have set us up for far greater success. We would have spent more time on the project as he was a new contractor with us instead of letting him do his thing, stopping in, trying to drop off a check. We were both working more than full-time jobs. I managed multiple clinics, had two very small children and was just trying to keep, you know, this getting this real estate investing business off the ground. And Dan was working 24 seven. So we would have found a way or made sure that we had something that could have managed it more. So we would have definitely spent more time there. We, rather than verify by just walking in, taking a quick peek and then signing off on checks, we would have spent a whole lot more energy now things that you would think to look for, but it sounds silly. Who would have thought you'd go look at the plumbing and see if it comes out of the wall, but I would go do that. I would go check now. If they told me that they have completed a repair, I'm going to go take a look at that. And if need be, when we first started working together, I, I might even consider having someone that could do an additional check on that for me so that I could confirm that it was done. And I would never never, Jay Conner would tell you, never do this. I would never give them any funds up front. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't set up the contract in such a way that they're talking for draws on very small projects instead of a scope of work. The scope of work was just not adequate to be saying, hey, you need to run over here and give me a check so that I can get my guys paid and get materials and things like that. That just doesn't make sense. So we don't work with people like that at all anymore. But I would have you know, knowing now what I know that I wouldn't have ever even made those decisions. So I wouldn't have ever given them money in advance to get them started. 
And I would by all means not have paid them on these piddly little projects or said, oh, sure, we'll give you this big chunk of money so you can go out and get supplies so that I can be sitting here holding the bag when I discover you've taken everything out of this house, including some of my supplies that I've already paid for and I have to pay somebody else to do it. (laughs) I got it. I got it. So uh, are you all working with more than one contractor these days or one contractor? More than one contractor. And we also have very close relationship with multiple subcontractors. So we don't just depend, especially on some of our smaller jobs, we don't just depend on our general contractors to take care of those things. We'll actually reach out to a subcontractor and get those things taken care of and sub them out on our own if we have enough of, I mean, all of them that we have that relationship with that we would feel comfortable to reach out. So how are you finding your contractors these days? That's a great question. Uh, So the majority of the contractors that we get now come through Facebook Marketplace. So I'll put a job posting in there uh, looking for a general contractor or looking for subs in this one specific city because we live in an area that has multiple cities all scattered very close to each other. And they come flooding in now that you have to screen through them, obviously. But I found that the ones coming from Facebook seem to be a little bit more uh, successful than the ones coming from Craigslist. I was just going to add that we also, one of the contractors that we've had a long-term relationship with, that actually came from one of the realtors yes. uh, that's in our network, and they have a very strong history. So that came by recommendation and was definitely a good good place to find one. Mm-hmm. I got you. So any other lessons learned from this deal? <laughs> actually, a good lesson was, despite the advisement from our realtor, At that point saying, you know, I really think this is too low an offer and they're not going to accept it. And even coming back to us after he was willing to finally make the offer, came back to us the day that we were waiting for final word. He was saying, you know, I just don't think this is going to happen. I really feel like you're too low. I feel like you need to come back in. And then probably about an hour later, we got the approval that they accepted it. So I would just say, you know, don't hesitate to stick to your guns a little bit. And you'd be surprised how many of these properties that you feel like you didn't get, if you keep an eye on, they're going to come back around because that's something we've discovered over the course of time occurs quite often, much more than you would expect that these deals fall through. So you have not, you know, maybe you didn't get it at that point for good reason. It's time to go ahead and come back with an offer and you'll find that they'll accept a lower offer than they would have initially. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Any other parting comments before we call this show a wrap? I don't have any parting comments. I'm glad that that lesson is over and that I've learned it. So I don't have to keep doing that anymore. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Well, Dan and Crystal, thank you so much for taking time to be on the show. And everybody, uh, we're going to be having Dan and Crystal back on soon again for another case study and more lessons learned from the deals they're doing. So congratulations to all your all success, Crystal and Dan. Thank you, Jay thank Connor. You. We appreciate it. I owe so much to you. Well, thank you so much. All right. Thank you for joining in, everyone. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. And here's to taking your real estate investing business to the next level. Until the next show, bye for now. <laughs>